Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. For what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This morning I want to go ahead and preach on this word, becoming the person that God desires me to be. And before I pray, if I could just ask a favor of everybody, would just silence your phone, please, for just a moment, or turn it off would be helpful, and that would be great. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 12, I come here with this subject matter, becoming the person that God desires you and I to be. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing of being able to gather together, and may you just open up the Word of God in a real and fresh way. Probably this, is a, this particular passage is one that we've read many, many times. Help us to get some clarity on what you're driving at in these verses. Thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. So far, the journey in the 88 verses of this sermon uh, that has been preached by Jesus has been very, very convicting. I don't know about you, but I have found a lot of conviction by the words that's spoken in this particular sermon. Throughout this sermon, what we commonly call the Sermon on the Mount, it has been Jesus teaching about the type of people who literally make up His kingdom. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, he began talking about the Beatitudes here, and that is eight characteristics that will be in the life of someone who is truly born again. What were those Beatitudes? Well, people that are truly born again have come to God realizing they're spiritually bankrupt and in need of a Savior. They are people who mourn uh, when the world boasts over sin. They are people who become meek in the face of injustice. They are people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They are merciful because they know by showing mercy they will obtain mercy. They are pure in heart and the peacemakers. And sadly, these people characterized this way are going to find more and more that persecution will come their way because they're standing for Jesus. But as we moved through the sermon and got beyond the Beatitudes, we saw that Jesus began contrasting these characteristics with the way the Pharisees were, and in fact, he called it the righteousness of the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 20, Jesus said, Now accept your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, why is he referring to it as the righteousness of the Pharisees? Well, here was what they felt was right. This was the Pharisees' righteousness. They actually cheapened God's commands so they could fulfill them. In other words, they taught people, Look, it's not so much uh, about, uh, it, it really, actually, they taught that if one had not committed physical murder, then he was fulfilling God's commands. If the, you were angry with someone here, uh, you, you, that was okay. They gave justifications for certain anger. They taught if a person did not commit physical adultery, that he kept the law, but Christ taught that if someone had lusted, he had committed adultery already in his heart. You see, what the Pharisees were all about is practicing an outward religion. Their righteousness was all on the surface. But I want you to know that God, through this Sermon on the Mount, is letting us realize that he's concerned not just about the surface, but also about inward purity. Matthew chapter 6, as we move further on in the sermon, Christ continued to show how the Pharisees made that outward show. In fact, the spiritual disciplines such as prayer, fasting, 
giving to the poor, all of that was done not to honor God, but to lift themselves up. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, this passage we looked at last week about the matter of judging. In fact, Jesus told his disciples that it's important that you take those big problems out of your own eye so you can see properly what is wrong with your fellow brother. Now, truthfully, as we've moved through this sermon, it's pretty amazing that if you've been convicted like I've been convicted, we look at these standards that God establishes in this Sermon on the Mount and we think to ourselves, that's impossible for me to uphold those things. It's impossible for me to live that way. It's impossible for me to follow those things. And you're right. I'm exactly right. In our own strength, in our own way, you and I cannot follow these particular things. You may look at it and feel dejected and and downtrodden because you say, well, I'm incapable of doing those things. I'm incapable of being the type of person God wants me to be. And there are others who will condemn themselves and became weighed down with the stress of, can I really accomplish this? But I want to tell you that we come to this passage of Scripture And God just doesn't dump all of this on you and say, figure it out on your own. God doesn't put all these standards out and say, I hope somehow you come to a place where you can be like the person I want you to be. But truly, when we come to this passage of Scripture, God realizes that the demands are heavy, that the stakes are high, and so He invites us to do something. He invites us to do something that we all know in the Christian life, though that one word is not used in these verses that I read. It is the word pray. You see, you find yourself struggling living the Christian life. You find that these demands here, these things that should characterize we who are born again, you find yourself having a difficulty living that way. I know I do. I mean, I, 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 I would dare say I'm not the only one that finds myself struggling to live. But notice what Jesus says. I want you to ask. I want you to seek. I want you to knock on those doors of opportunity. Because when you ask and seek and knock, I'm going to give you those things that you're asking that are lined up with my will. So in this short text today, It's my desire to open up this dialogue about the subject that Jesus brings us to of prayer and let us understand what it means to be the person that God wants us to be. Four things I'm going to share with you from these verses. First of all, verse number seven, notice here, we ought to consider our prayer life. Now, while the word pray, as I've already alluded to, is not used in these verses we do understand this has to do with the subject of prayer. But notice here, Jesus gives us three specific types of praying. What are they? Ask, seek, knock. Could we say those three words together? Ready? Ask, seek, knock. Now you say, well, preacher, why does Jesus throw these three words out? Well, I want you to think with me about these specific types of praying. Asking refers to the idea of making a simple petition. It is the idea of formulating a request and bringing it to the one who can answer that for you. But the word seeking now, now we move into a little bit further avenue. And seeking has this idea of searching for something that is lost or has not yet been discovered. In other words, the verb here for the word seek is this additional sense of actually being devoted with a serious effort to find that which you are searching for. There's a diligence about it. But now as we come to the word knock, when a person knocks on a door, they do so because they come to a place where they want to enter, but that door basically keeps them from moving from one place to the next. When a person knocks on a door, he seeks permission, if you will, to enter into that room or to that home. 
Now, our problem when considering this verse really is twofold. First of all, most believers do not pray according to verse number 7. And second problem is, we actually don't understand what Jesus is really saying when he invites us to ask, seek, and knock. In order to understand what Jesus is getting at, we have to come back to the context of what I gave in the introduction to this sermon. Most people, when they read this verse, they look at the asking, seeking, and knocking as a blank check. They have this idea, oh, God wants me to ask for a Rolls Royce. Oh, God wants me to ask for a million dollars. I want to tell you something. Jesus here is not talking necessarily about power, fame, fortune, good health, good looks, all of those things, but he is talking here about the spiritual things of Matthew 5 and 6 that he's inviting us to ask for those things. What are those things that Jesus is inviting us to ask? Well, let's do something here for just a moment. If you've got your Bibles open, turn back to Matthew chapter number 5, and let's note this here. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 3, what should we be asking for? Well, the Bible says that one of the first characteristics of those that are part of His kingdom is they're blessed in They're blessed because they're poor in spirit. So therefore, I ought to be praying before God that I would come spiritually before Him with a bankrupt soul. That I would recognize that it's not me that can accomplish it. It's all God. Notice verse number 6 of Matthew 5. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. You say, preacher, you know, I set my alarm this morning, and I got an extra hour of sleep, and that's a great thing. But I wasn't really enthused about coming to church. I just kind of didn't really feel it. Or, you know, when it comes to reading my Bible at home, I really just don't have that. I want to tell you something. God's asking you to ask Him and seek and knock so you can have that hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Notice verse number 48 At the end of chapter 5, he says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. God is going to do some things in your life, and maybe you still have some rough edges, and maybe you've got some things that God needs to fine-tune in your life. And as you ask and seek and knock for those areas, God will do a mighty work in your life. Let's turn to chapter 6. Notice verses 9 and 10. Our This prayer that Jesus gave, this model prayer, after this manner, therefore pray, our Father which in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Are you praying for God's will to be done in your life? Now, I could continue walking through all of these verses of Matthew 5, 6, leading up to our text here today, but I want you to say, notice something. I believe that when we come to Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, it's as if Jesus is saying these words. I realize you may not have these things that I've spoken about, but they all can be yours, and all you need to do is ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find, and knock, it shall be opened unto you. So the first thing I've got to consider when it's about the person that God wants to be is I've got to consider my prayer life. Many of us come into church, we hear things that are preached on, things that affect our lives as believers, and then we walk out giving no consideration to God, barely talking to Him. Our prayers are relegated to mealtime, a little simple prayer before we go to bed, but we rarely ask God to help us live for Him. So we come back the next Sunday and we say, well, I just don't know why God's not doing things for me. I don't know why God's not helping me like He's helping this other person. I don't know why God doesn't show interest in me. But I want to tell you, God is inviting you to seek Him, to pray and ask and seek and knock for those things that God has readily available for you. But now notice number two, according to verse 7 and 8, there's to be a continual prayer. I'm to be the person that God wants me to be. How's that going to happen? Well, I've got to continually pray. Now, 
I'm going to share something with you in just a moment here about these words. And I do not want you to believe for one moment that people cannot understand the Word of God without knowing the original languages. But there is something very special that is given in these words. The words ask, seek, and knock, when we understand what I'm going to share with you, it opens up some very powerful truths. Well, what are those? Well, first of all, these words, ask, seek, and knock, are given in the Greek language as imperatives. Now, aren't you glad that you learned that word here today, imperatives? In the Greek language, there are two imperatives. Number one, there is the aorist imperative. Number two, there is the present imperative. Now, if I took the word ask, here is the uh, aorist imperative. It is this. If I said to my wife, well, go and ask this person for this, and, and she just went and did it. But that's not the idea that is used here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. It is in the present imperative, and it has this idea. It means to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And when you keep on doing these things, you will eventually find the results that you're looking for. Now be reminded, this is not asking for things outside of God's will. I know some of you that are leaning down and praying for some big landfall to happen to you and some big amount of money to be thrown your way or some brand new car. That's not what God's getting at in this passage of Scripture. We're in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, spiritual truths that He wants you to have. And therefore, if you need these spiritual truths and you need to learn how to forgive others and you need to be overcoming this area of anger and the area of lust and all of these other areas, then I want to tell you something. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Far too many of us are shallow in our prayers and we're impatient. We find ourselves living in this time that we're in, that if we don't receive immediate results, then we go off to something else. But I want to tell you, God's inviting us here to keep on praying, keep on seeking Him, keep on knocking. Notice verses 9 through 11, the third thing, and that is to confidently pray. Confidently pray. I love these verses. In fact, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount from time to time here, shows some humor. And Jesus humorously illustrates for us the goodness of God in answering the needs of His children. Notice here, He gives an analogy about human fathers. Now, let's just describe all human fathers for just a moment because He uses this word here in verse number uh, 11. He talks about if ye, that is the fathers, being evil. Now, he's, he's not talking here, oh, these wicked men. I mean, not, not necessarily, but those of us who are fathers, we all have a human nature. We have sinful inclinations. And to those of us who have sinful inclinations due to the sin nature, even we will give good gifts to our children. Every dad that has at least some good sense about him, oh yeah, he's got the evil nature, but I can tell you, raising my three children, that if they ask for something that was necessary and good for them, I as a dad would want to supply it. I'd want to give it to them. I'd want to do that because here he says, no good father, if his son asks for a piece of bread, he leans down and he picks up this stone and he goes, here son have a piece of stone. Or if his son asks for something else, he goes ahead and gives him a snake. Now, it could refer to a, a snake that it was uh, still alive, or it could refer to a cooked snake. I don't know what it refers to here, but the idea is that any good father, even with an evil nature, will still desire to meet the needs of his child. How much more does a good God in heaven who has no evil inclination, how much more does he not want to supply these things for you and me? All of these spiritual truths, 
I mean, do you not think God wants you to have this? Sure he does. He wants you to have these things embedded in your soul. He wants these things to be a part of your life. And so therefore, as you seek Him and as you ask Him and knock on the door and you continually do those things, you're going to come to a place where you have to realize God can provide. God will provide. And therefore, by praying confidently, you must realize two crucial areas. Number one, that you come by faith and trust that God can give it. And number two, you come to the one who's described as your heavenly Father. You ever thought about God as your Father? Oh, sometimes we walk around and just talk about God or we refer to Him as the Lord. But I want to tell you one of the great truths that is spoken of in the New Testament for every born-again believer is that as a child of God, I come to my heavenly Father. Wow, that is wonderful. And so therefore, we ought to confidently pray for these things because we're coming to the one who desires to give it, who wants to give it. But now notice, lastly, according to verse number 12. I thought since you had an extra hour of sleep, I had an extra hour of preaching this morning, but I may wrap up a little early, okay? But notice verse number 12. Look what he says here. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, how many of you know two words that summarize what this verse is all about? Can you give me the words? All right, I heard a few of you. The golden rule. Golden rule. The golden rule basically says that we must treat others as we would want them to treat us. That's pretty amazing here that when you read this passage of Scripture, we wouldn't say now everything ultimately originates with the Lord. All right, I understand that. But these words did not necessarily come first from the lips of the Lord while on this earth. This was something that you could have traced back the last few thousand years where different societies took this rule that we know of as the golden rule and put it in their own words. For instance, Confucius often would say, do not to others what you would not wish done to yourself. There was a rabbi that lived around the time of Jesus who actually summarized the law by saying, what is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. This is the whole law. All the rest is commentary. Go and learn it. The Stoics there uh, within the Greek culture would advocate a particular principle. What you do not want to be done to you, do not do to anyone else. You know what's amazing? We could probably line up a number of other statements that are very similar. But when you observe every ancient paraphrase of the golden rule, it is always given in the negative. But when Jesus gives verse number 12 here, he takes it and turns it around and he gives it here in the positive sense. In other words, when Jesus gives this golden rule, it actually becomes more demanding of us. It becomes harder. You say, well, how so? Well, let me just go ahead and say this. It's one thing for you to not steal from somebody, but it's a whole other thing for you to be generous and give back to somebody. It's one thing for you not to slander somebody, It's a whole other thing for you to go ahead and edify them with your words. It's one thing not to hurt somebody, but it's a whole other thing to forgive them. So while the negative version of all these other groups of people who gave the golden rule calls people not to sin, you know what Jesus is doing? He's calling people and you and I to actually respond in love. 
And how amazing it is that when you read further on in the book of Matthew, Jesus said that love is the fulfillment of all the commandments, is it not? What's the first commandment that Jesus gave? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And then he says, and the second is like unto it, that you would love others, your neighbor, as yourself. It's a fulfillment of the law. So it's quite interesting, though, now, when we come to this verse number 12, it begins with this word, therefore. You've heard me say before, and it's not original with me, that when you see the word, therefore, it's important to know what it is there for. So what's Christ telling us in verse number 12? Well, we have the ability as children of God to distribute the good gifts that God has given to us as we interact with other people. In other words, just as a good God will go ahead and give these things to us that we need as His children, so as representatives, we give those things to God. So here's the fourth point, according to verse number 12, is this. It is the aspect of modeling here. Can we put the next point on here? Copy your Father in heaven. In other words, give to others as you have been given. God who in heaven desires to give, we seek Him, we knock, we ask for these things. God gives it to us. Now in our interactions with other people, now we need to model the goodness that God has shown in our life and begin to give it to other people. Oh, when God the Father gives you and I the good gifts that we really need, those things that we've asked for and sought and knocked on the door, then we can have the love and treat others the way we'd want to be treated. We can now love them as we would desire to be loved. We can be generous towards other people as God has been generous to us. We can now judge other people properly as we would want someone to make judgments about our life. And I believe that the implication of this verse is so very simple. In other words, as God has been good to you, go out and be good to others. You say, well, preacher, that's easy in theory, but you don't know this person. You don't know the person that I have been sitting on the opposite side of the church because, boy, I tell you what, we just, we, we have, we clash and we've got some problems. You know what God wants you to do? He desires that you, as a recipient of what God can give as you ask, seek, and knock, He wants you to be a recipient to all of these people around you as you interact. And if you start finding a problem, you know what God wants you to do? Ask for help to meet the needs of that person. Seek Him so you can meet the needs of that person. Knock on the door that seems to be closed to you so that way you can come and meet the needs of that person. Because God desires as we come together for services, as we come, and far too many people don't realize the importance and the value of meeting together and the services because it is your opportunity to flesh out what God has done in your life, to be around other Christians. And so therefore, as we have been shown such goodness by God, therefore, we share it with others. And I love what Jesus says here. In the end of verse number 12, he says, this is the law and the prophets. In other words, what he's saying is, when you do good to others, this summarizes every bit of what the Old Testament is. Now, I'm glad he didn't say this summarized the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees, because they seem to constantly be changing things. No, no, they had done things and said certain things that misrepresented the law and the prophets. But Jesus said, if you ask, seek, and knock, and you show goodness to other people as you've had goodness shown to you, then I want to tell you something. This fulfills the very thing that the law has told us and the prophets. 
As I conclude this morning, I want you to look back at verses 7 through 8, and I want you to notice something. Let me read this again. Let's see if you catch this. Ask, and it shall be given you. Now, notice the emphasis on the words I'm giving. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. Can I ask you a question? Do you see any exceptions here? Do you see God saying, well, it's good for this group of people, but not that group of people. No, no. When you come and ask according to God's will, and you ask for the things that are spoken about in this sermon, I'm telling you, Jesus is saying that if you ask appropriately, you ask according to His will, it will be given. Period. That's it. God desires to pour His blessing. And to give those things that he shared. You may not have it. You may not feel like there's much. But I want to tell you something. The reason you don't have it is like James says. You have not because you ask not. Now look. Sometimes when my kids were growing up. And they'd start sniveling and whining about a little something. And I'd say well why didn't you ask me? I'd help you with this. Well, you're just too busy, and you know, and they had all these excuses. And really, as a dad, all I had to say to them was, if you simply would have asked, I would have helped you. You know why most of us aren't living the Christian life with a lot of fruit? Why we're not living the Christian life as God has intended it to be is because you're not asking for these things as God has put out there. You're not asking and seeking and knocking. And some of you, as James says, he says, you have not because you ask not. But then he says, there's another type of praying. He says, some of you are asking amiss. That is, you're asking for things that are suiting what you feel your needs are. Oh, Lord, I, I, I need this bundle of money, and I need this, and I need... And it's not that all of those things are wrong in and of themselves, but you're asking sometimes for the wrong things. And God wants you to come back and seek Him for the spiritual things. And I want to tell you, as Matthew 6.33 says, if you seek first the kingdom of God, all of these other things that may concern you, God is going to see that those needs are met as well. He's going to meet them. So I believe, sadly, that many, probably many in this room, will be surprised when you get to heaven. You mean if I had just asked, I could have had what God wanted me to have? You mean if I really, really sought it out and had this desire to find what God wanted to me to have, then I could have had it? You mean if I just kept on knocking that God would have given it? Sure, I think there will be a lot of people that will get to heaven and be surprised. Because you'll realize that God has done some tremendous things for them. So how do we apply this here today? How do we apply this? Well, first of all, I want to encourage you here today. First of all, some of you need to start getting serious and come to God in prayer. Let me ask you to evaluate your prayer life for just a moment. What is your prayer life like? Many Christians, it's just simple bedtime prayers, little dinner prayers, praying in a group of people, just, you know, very simple. But really, you're not spending time with God. And I think the reason a lot of people don't spend time with God is because they feel that God is so distant from them. They've got these obstacles in life, they got all these problems, and they think to themselves, you know, 
I know the preacher says to pray, and I know he tells us to ask and seek and not, but it just seems like God doesn't hear me like he hears the preacher. It doesn't seem like God is anywhere available to me. Well, then that makes verses 7 and 8 even more powerful. Ask, seek, knock. My son, when he was growing up, my my children, if they were right in my presence, they might look right up at me and ask a question. But let's say that I was not in their presence and they really wanted to do something and they searched all the way through the house and they found me and then they blurted out their question. But let's say as they searched the house, I was in my office and the door was closed and they really wanted their request answered. Guess what I heard a lot of times? Dad! Dad! Door opens, questions asked. Many times, request is granted. For those of you who feel that God is away... That God is near, ask. Keep on asking. Those of you who feel that God is not so near to you, guess what he's encouraging you to do? Seek after him. And for those of you who feel like there's this boundary in your life and there's these problems that you can't even see where God is, then God is telling you, go ahead and knock. And when you ask you'll receive it. When you seek, you'll find it. And when you knock, it will be open to you. Some of you today need to consider some of the very specific things for you to ask for. Some of you need humility today. Some of you need to ask God to help you to forgive someone, but you're having a hard time with it. Some of you need to ask God to help you to love someone who's not so easy to love. Some of you need to deal with sin in another person's life, as we talked about last week, but you need to make sure that you don't do it with a critical spirit and that you come in just the right manner. I don't know what God has laid out in your heart, but I want to encourage you today to do business with God and to yield yourself before Him and say, Lord, I've not been praying as I ought to, but I'm giving myself a new and a fresh today, and I'm going to start really praying before God. Some of you have some specific needs, and you need to come before God and ask and seek and knock. And I'm telling you, God will answer. Let's go ahead and pray together. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed here today, nobody's looking around. I do realize that this passage of Scripture is very, very much applied to those who are born again in Christ, those who are already saved. But you say, preacher, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I have eternal life. You realize last week we had somebody that opened their heart up to Jesus and prayed to accept Christ as their Savior right in the service, and what a glory that was. But I want to tell you, for you to be saved, you've got to get a right understanding of that verse number 12, the golden rule. You know, in our world, the devil has really been deceptive with people, and he has spread the lie that you do good. If you treat others right, if you do some good things, then you'll be able to go to heaven. Hey, I want to tell you something. The golden rule is a good thing for us to live as Christians and to complete in our lives. But I want to tell you something. Just because you have the golden rule doesn't mean that it's going to take you to heaven. What takes you to heaven is someone else who lived perfectly and did good for you, and that was Jesus Christ. You say, what's the difference between Jesus who lived good and me who's trying to live good? I want to tell you something. Every one of us, as the Bible says, falls short. We sin. We've missed the mark. And that sin is going to carry us to a place called the lake of fire if we die without Jesus Christ. But Jesus, who was the perfect, sinless Son of God, died on the cross 
and he was buried and he rose again. And today he invites people to place their faith and trust in him alone. What are you trusting in to go to heaven? What are you trusting in to give you eternal life? I want to tell you the only correct biblical answer is Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, I, I, I'm here and I, I, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying and boy, I'd like to have this eternal life. Then I'd like to invite you to pray a simple little prayer. Please understand the words necessarily aren't what save you. It is the heart. The Bible says that with the heart confession is made, with the mouth we speak forth these things. And so I want to invite you today to pray a little simple prayer and ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you of your sins and become your Savior. If you'd like to pray that prayer, why don't you repeat these words after me, meaning it with your heart. You pray it to yourself as I pray it out loud. Here's the prayer. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I cannot save myself. But I believe that Jesus died to pay for my sins. And he was buried and he rose again the third day. And I believe that Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, desires to forgive me of all my sins. And right now I'm asking him to forgive me of all my sins and become my personal Savior. Now if you're here today and you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I'm not going to call you out. But I'd sure love to just personally just rejoice with you that you asked the Lord to be your Savior. How many are here today and say, Preacher, I'm not ashamed of it, but I prayed to receive Christ as my Savior. You just lift your hand right now while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Anyone here today? God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else here today? Preacher, I just prayed that prayer and I asked the Lord to come into my heart, asked Him to be my Savior. Today, whether it is that you're dealing with assurance of salvation, whether you're dealing here with the first time you've trusted Christ as Savior, when we have our invitation, I'm going to step around to the front. We'll have other personal workers will be here. But I want to invite you to come if you pray that prayer. And I'll place you with somebody who can open up the Scriptures with you and we can get some material in your hand to help you know this new found faith in Jesus Christ, how beautiful it is. Christians, may I talk to you for just a moment? If your prayer life isn't what you know it ought to be, then I want you to come to the altar here and I want you to yield yourself to God. If there are certain things that you need in your Christian life and they're lacking, then I want to encourage you here today. Why don't you come and ask God, ask Him here at this altar. Seek Him here at this altar. Knock, if you will, at this altar and say, God, I'm not leaving till I get an answer. I'm seeking you because I need these things in my life. I want you to go ahead and with your heads bowed, eyes closed, if you would just stand to your feet quietly, please. I'm going to pray. As soon as I say amen, I'm going to step down and I want to invite you to do business with God. Those that are unsaved need to pray and receive Christ as Savior. Maybe you're here today and you've never been baptized. I'd like to invite you, if you've been saved, then to make a decision and say, I I want to get baptized, and I'm going to do that. Maybe you're here today, and you need to join Calvary Baptist Church, and you've been thinking about it for a while. Why don't you come forward, make it known. The process begins with you making it known right up here. I'd like to join Calvary Baptist. For those of you that God's working in your life about prayer, about some particular matter in your life, why don't you come and and lay it before the Lord here today. Let me pray. We'll begin our invitation. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing of being able to gather together. And may you help in this invitation time. May may there be decisions made for the sake of the gospel, for the cause of Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.